Hello, I'm Al Taylor, President of Carolina's Healthcare System Stanley, and welcome to HealthBeat. HealthBeat is a program that we've designed to bring information to you about your healthy living and other information from our health professionals throughout our community. And first, before we get started with the program, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Shaver, you know, what's brought you back to this community to practice medicine? So definitely glad to be back. This is my hometown. My family still lives here. Uh, my wife, Elizabeth, uh, is also from here. She's from the New London area. So definitely happy to be back in town. Wanted to help take care of the, the people and, and, and family members of the community and all the people that I know. And uh, just glad to have this opportunity. Today we want to talk about colorectal cancer and the importance of medical screenings. Um, so what is colorectal cancer? So colorectal cancer is, is cancer of the large intestine. Uh, what is cancer, you might ask? Cancer is an abnormal growth of the tissue in the colon. The colon's broken down into multiple segments. Um, we can talk about this a little bit later. Uh, but there's the main colon, there's the rectum, and there's the anus. You can have cancer of any of those three segments of the colon. And so it's very important that we talk about screening for colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, how common is colon cancer? So in fact, it's actually one of the most common preventable causes of cancer-related death in the U.S. Approximately 100,000 new cases of colorectal cancer in the U.S. during each year. And there's also approximately 40,000 new cases of rectal cancer in the U.S. each year. So it's a fairly common cancer. Well, so I know when people have screenings and things going on, they hear things like, a, you know, I had a polyp. So, so what exactly is a polyp when we talk about cancer versus just being a polyp? Right. So a, a polyp uh, is actually, in most cases, can be precancers or it may in fact be benign. There are multiple types of polyps. The most common types of polyps being adenomas, which are precancerous polyps, and hyperplastic polyps, which are actually benign polyps, which carry no increased risk of malignancy. Uh, the ones that we worry about, obviously, are the adenomatous polyps, uh, which are there are three types, tubular adenomas, villus adenomas, and tubular villus adenomas. Each of those carries its own distinct risk of turning into colon cancer. However, if left in place, those three will turn into colon cancer at some point during the patient's life. Okay. Well, what is uh, Carolina's Healthcare System Stanley doing to promote uh, awareness about colorectal cancer? So obviously we're here today and we're talking about, about this on our Health, health Beat uh, segment. Uh, we're also putting ads out in the paper and we're trying to do our part to go out to the community, give local talks, go out to the local uh, churches um, and, and spread word that way. Uh, so as far as the hospital itself, we're promoting and practicing with screening colonoscopies. So uh, what age did most people get uh, colorectal cancer screenings? So we recommend that most patients become or get screened at the age of 50 unless they have a family member, first degree relative such as their mother, their father, or their sibling who has had colorectal cancer. And then we recommend at the age 10 years below the age for which they developed the colorectal cancer or the age of 50, whichever is earlier. Okay, so if somebody had cancer at age 42, their mother did, then they needed it at 32, 32 that is they correct. need to have that, that screening done. Okay, oh, wow. So the most common screening tool uh, in colonoscopy, uh, you know, is, uh, is the colonoscopy. So, you know, but there are a lot of fears about getting a colonoscopy. Can, can you dispel some of those myths about, you know, getting that screening done? Because I think a lot of times people are, know they should do it, but they don't know what that's all about and just don't want to do it. Definitely, definitely. So. A lot of times when patients come to my office and I see that they haven't had a colonoscopy in the past, I will sometimes approach uh, that conversation with them and uh, they're obviously concerned about uh, all the horror stories that they've heard from friends. Uh, the good thing is the preps, which is the most uncomfortable thing of the whole process, uh, have, have improved dramatically over the past few years. Uh, that was the most common, commonly held problem with the, the colonoscopy in the past. People just didn't tolerate it well, it made them sick. But now we've split the doses up in the prep. Um, it's a lot more tolerable. The volume of, of the stuff that they have to drink uh, is, is much less. And by prep, uh, for those who don't know what a prep is, you have to drink the stuff to help clean out your system so that we can get a good view of the colon and, and, and the wall of the colon while we're in there looking at it with the camera. As far as the procedure itself, very straightforward. It takes roughly 15 to, to 40, 45 minutes to perform. as an outpatient procedure. You come in, you leave the same day and uh, generally is well tolerated. Okay. So um, what factors may affect the person's risk of developing uh, colorectal cancer so and polyps? So multiple factors. So obviously we talked about one previously with a family history of colorectal cancer. So there are some genetic factors which play a role. Uh, there are factors that we can control, however. Uh, 
looking at vitamin D levels, there's new data out that low vitamin D levels can lead to colorectal cancer. Diets high in red meats can lead to colorectal cancer. Smoking can lead to colorectal cancer. High levels of alcohol can lead to colorectal cancer. So those are all factors that, that can play into the role of developing a colorectal cancer. And obviously, if, if you don't get screened at the appropriate time, then that also puts you at risk for developing a colorectal well, cancer. Well, you know, that, that's quite interesting because I think a lot of times we don't realize when people think about, you know, the, just the healthy living habits that they need to have, how it affects. A lot of times they'll think how it affects lung cancer and things like that, but obviously that, that's, that's interesting to, to know how it affects both uh, colorectal cancer as well, so very, very important for folks. So what are some of the symptoms that people have, uh, you know, that may indicate colorectal cancer? So obviously uh, the colorectal cancer can be a symptomless disease, meaning that you don't really experience anything at all. You go in for your colorectal cancer screening and you have a colorectal cancer. Now that's not very common, uh, but it does happen. Other things that we ask for in our typical preoperative visit, uh, we'll ask these questions and they include bleeding uh, per the rectum, bright red or dark, um, abdominal pain, pain in your, in your bottom whenever you have a bowel movement, uh, weight loss, night sweats, fevers, chills, if you have any lumps or bumps in your armpits around your neck, uh, those are what we call lymph nodes. Uh, so we definitely look for those sorts of things. If your, if your stool changes caliber, meaning if it becomes like a pencil instead of the normal bulky stool, then that's also a, a worrisome feature. Other things we ask about are constipation, diarrhea. Uh, so multiple things uh, can, can indicate that you have colorectal cancer, but because you have one of those things definitely doesn't mean that you do have colorectal right. cancer. Well, I think one of the key things when you first said is that, that a lot of times there's, there's not a symptom there. And so that really tells us the importance of having that screening done because obviously if you wait till some, you have a lot of symptoms, then you're, you're down the road of much, much more difficulty. That is that's 100 percent correct. A lot of times those patients who come in with abdominal pain and have multiple, uh, multiple symptoms are the ones that have full-fledged cancer. Right. So, you know, we know cancer, uh, cancer care is very complex. And uh, so what are some of the services and treatment op options that, that folks have uh, through the Levine Cancer Institute and the Roy Henson Cancer Center that we have here on our campus at Carolina's Healthcare System, Stanley. Right. So, so access to the Levine Cancer Institute and the Roy Henson Cancer Center is, it provides Stanley County with world-class care. So we have the same doctors and physicians that practice in Charlotte at the main CHS facilities coming here and practicing here and, and bringing all the knowledge that they have to our community. And what does that mean? That means that we have access to clinical trials that we typically would, would not have had access to in the past. We have our own oncologist here, Dr. Indiru, who does an excellent job of managing the adjuvant chemotherapy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, care. Um, we also have radiation oncology, uh, which plays a role in the rectal and anal cancer sometimes. So we have all that here at our finger, fingertips, and I think a lot of people don't understand that we have that, that resource available, and it's a very important resource. Yeah, it absolutely is. I think the, the fact that we've had the, the cancer, Levine Cancer Institute here over the, the last several years, um, it's really amazing to me to see what uh, we can provide at a uh, community hospital versus uh, what's downtown. We can do virtually everything except they're very, uh, and if there's something that we need to, to transfer down, we will, but for the most part, uh, we're doing everything here. So, you know, you, we've talked about the screenings and things that, that occur and the, the services that are available. So, so what happens when somebody has the diagnosis of that they've got colorectal cancer? Okay, so we can kind of take this from start to finish here. So we start off, we, we have you, you take your prep, you get your colonoscopy, obviously. Uh, we get in there, let's say we find a colon cancer. Uh, depends on where the colon cancer is, depends on what the next step's gonna be. Now, obviously, we're gonna present you at our, our local tumor board, uh, which occurs every Tuesday. Uh, we like to do that before we ever take you to the operative suite to operate, uh, because it's important to get a multidisciplinary approach to taking care of the patient. Uh, so who's at the tumor board, you might ask. Uh, so the tumor board, we have a, a geneticist, uh, who is there. Uh, we have the nurse navigators who are there. Uh, they stay with the patient every step of the way. If there's any questions, they're always there. These, these ladies are excellent, excellent resources that they have. The radiologists are there so they can review all the x-rays, the PET scans, if we have PET scans, um, all the important stuff that we need to see to see if there's distant disease anywhere because that can change what we do in, in the order that we do it. The oncologists are there, the cancer doctors. Uh, they can discuss chemotherapy options, whether that's they get chemotherapy before surgery, if they get chemotherapy after surgery, 
or if they need chemotherapy at all, which is why we're doing colorectal cancer screening. Hopefully we catch this soon enough that we don't have to give you chemotherapy. Uh, the radiation oncologists are there. Now, they, don't, they have a pretty limited role when we, when we talk about colon cancer itself, but when we talk about those other areas, such as the rectum and anus, they have an important role, and so it's important to talk to them there. So then you get presented at our local tumor board. We bring you back. We make our decision. So let's say you had to have a surgery, okay? Depends on where in the colon it is. Depends on what type of surgery. Now, we feel like we're kind of ahead of the game here. We offer laparoscopic colon resections, uh, which a lot of places aren't necessarily offering, uh, which is laparoscopic means a little tiny incisions. Um, so okay. we kind of minimize the, the wound and the recovery times a lot quicker. And, and patients do really well uh, from those surgeries. So then we, we, we do whatever colon resection you need, and we can talk about the types of surgery here in a little bit. Then afterwards, depends on the stage of the, the tumor as to what the next step will be. So any stage three or above colon cancer typically will get chemotherapy after the fact, okay? Uh, now a lot of that depends on how well you are, any other medical problems you might have, and if you can tolerate it. Not everybody can tolerate the chemotherapy. So, so how do they determine what the stage of that, the cancer is? I mean, are there, I know we talked about the radiation oncologist, the, the other cancer doctors, and the radiologists doing all of this. I know pathologists are, are another group that do some work. So, so how is it they, because we hear that a lot of times, if somebody says, well, I've got, my, my neighbor or friend's got stage one cancer or stage four cancer, and we all know, well, stage four sounds really bad from what we hear. Right. So, so what are those stages and how do they determine that? Yeah, so the, stage the one is, is very early stage disease, so no lymph nodes are typically involved, and the, the tumor itself only goes through part of the layer of the colon wall, okay, or, or the large intestine wall. Uh, that's treated with surgery, mm -hmm. and that's it. Uh, stage two cancers, uh, which go a little deeper through the wall, but typically still don't involve any lymph nodes, are also typically treated with surgery only. Now, there are some factors such as age and high risk factors such as looking at the, ge the genetics of the tumor itself, something called mismatch repair. I won't get into all that, uh, but if, if that is not present, then sometimes we will offer chemotherapy in those settings. Stage three typically means it's either going all the way through the wall of the colon or there are lymph nodes involved. Uh, those patients all typically receive chemotherapy. Uh, stage four disease can be a different story. Um, stage four means that it's going to another site somewhere else in the body, such as the liver or to the lungs. That's why it's important that we get preoperative CT scans. We have the radiologist there to look at those to make sure that it doesn't look like there's any other tumor anywhere else in the body, because uh, that obviously plays a role. Now, once again, we talked about rectal cancer. Those patients typically get chemotherapy and radiation up front. It shrinks the tumor um, and allows us to give a better resection. Uh, or, or taken out of that, that segment of the colon, uh, per se. So all those factors play a role. Um, that's how we stage it, and that's how we determine what the treatment's going to be. Ultimately, what we all look at uh, is something called the NCCN guidelines, or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, there actually is a great resource for, for patients. Uh, that There's a patient site where they can go in and read about the type of cancer or problem that they have. And it's not just colon cancer, it's any type of cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's what we use for our guidelines, and that's how we determine what the treatment treatment's going to be. Okay, great. So uh, I tell you, it's been you know really important. And as you walk through those stages of the cancer, I think one of the things that, that's really important as people think about this is, uh, you know, those first two phases. You know, if you do colonoscopy and you do that screening, you can catch those up front, do the surgery, and you're done. Uh, so that really tells us the importance of having those screenings done on a, on a timely basis. And I can't, I can't stress that enough because that's the purpose of the screening colonoscopy is to catch these adenomatous polyps that we talked about earlier before they turn into cancer or to catch the cancer at an early stage. Uh, because once again, if you can get by without surgery, it can save you chemotherapy. The cure rates are excellent. Um, and so if, one thing I can stress, I don't care, uh, we prefer you come here obviously, but. I don't care where you go, you need to get screened. Right, right. Well, one of the ways to, to get more information about, about that will be a health talk. Uh, it's a free health talk for colonoscopies on how to prevent colon cancer um, and the procedures uh, that are involved in that. And we're going to have one coming up. Uh, Dr. Shaver is going to be speaking at that event um, at uh, Monday, March 21st uh, at First Baptist Church in Locust. So we're very excited about that opportunity gives more folks the opportunity to get out there and learn a little bit about the screening and colorectal cancer, get to know Dr. Shaver, who has been practicing in our community for a couple of years, 
born and raised here, so um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're very glad to have him back in the community. Uh, and we encourage you to continue to, to look at the things that are going on throughout our community, the health care professionals that we have. Uh, look at uh, Stanley.org to find out more information about the professionals we have in the community and the things that we can do to make your life better and healthier. So thank you for uh, being with us here at Health Beat today.